Well, we give thanks to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Almighty God, for your hand that is upon the circumstances of this day, Father. We thank you that you stand over your word to confirm it with signs and wonders, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we have open hearts because you made our hearts open, Father. And so I pray that the word will fall on fertile soil, that every one of us will be challenged, Lord, with life and light, Father. Help us to present that which is of you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> we've been uh, talking about faith of late, and um, I-, I wondered whether I was finished last week, and then uh, the Lord said no. So um, I got another another message on faith I want to talk about today, and um, we'll see how the Lord leads us. And so we've, we've spoken about the why of faith, uh, the how or the source of faith. We've spoken about how faith, how faith works. We looked at the formula of faith, and we saw that there is a confession and a believing. And when I started talking about that a, a couple of weeks ago, I said that there is a, a third element sometimes that comes into how that works, and that's kind of the doing of faith. Amen? And we want to deal with that slightly today. Uh, so just by, I'm going to confuse Edward because he's typed out a whole bunch of scriptures diligently, and now I'm going to give him scriptures he hasn't typed out. Just relax, okay? Um, but, but in James 2 verse 14, it says, What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? So we know we're not talking about f- works to produce faith. We're talking about faith that produces works. In other words, your, your faith must be dynamic, must be vibrant, must be alive. Because of who, it is, who you are, a man and a woman of faith, you have outcomes that change the way you do things. Now, interestingly, Luke 15 and verse 18 says, uh, it's the story of the prodigal. You see the, the, the prodigal coming to a place of understanding that he has to make some changes in his life and get right with his father. And in the beginning of verse 18, he says, I will set out and go to my father. And in verse 20, the beginning, he says, so he set out and came to his father. Okay, Romans 8 verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. We need to understand that being a believer, committing to the Lord, being a man and a woman of faith is going to involve a positional change in your life. You are going to have to set out from where you are and go to the Father. Now, I know he lives in you. Bear with me. What I'm saying is for some other... And we'll, we'll get into a little bit more detail, but for, for most of us, there is something that has to change. We have to go on a journey. You know, originally, the believers were called those of the way. By their name, they were going somewhere. They were following a particular way of life. Jesus, when he talks to, um, to Peter, the first, almost the first instruction he gives Peter, and the last instruction he gives Peter, is you follow me. You follow me. You know, as, and I, I quoted Romans 8, for those who are being led, it's in the present continuous tense. God is not le- following us. He's leading us. There's a journey happening. We're going somewhere. Does that make sense? Amen. So well, I want to talk about the journey of faith. Because there's very often a journey necessary to move you from where you are without faith to where you need to be when you have faith. It's a repositioning. Sometimes it's a mental journey. Sometimes it's a spiritual journey. Sometimes it's an emotional journey. Sometimes it's a relational journey. But often we have to reposition ourselves. We have to change the way things are and go somewhere else, be led somewhere else, follow Jesus as we go. If we understand and get away from this notion that my faith moves God, my prayer moves God, and get a proper understanding and understand that my faith moves me to God. My prayer aligns me with God. My prayer, my faith changes me. God is unchanging. Amen? And so when we understand that, then we realize that when you look at Scripture, there's an enormous amount of examples, and I'll I'll just list a few for you. Noah, build the ark. Took him arguably between 75 and 120 years depending on which theologian you listen to. There was a journey from hearing to doing. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Jesus, Paul, all had to go on journeys. 
They all had to move from one place to another. Whether it be for Paul, Paul took 14 years to change his mind, his theological mindset, because he was raised as a Jew. And yet he was given the message of preaching salvation by grace with no works involved. So there's lots of things that we have to recognize as believers that we have to go on this journey. We have to be willing to go on this journey. And so often when we talk about the works of faith, we, we kind of limit it to I've got to go and do something tangible. Michelle talks about Angus Buck and the Faith Like Potatoes. If you listen to the documentary that comes with the movie, he didn't just plant his crop, his fields. He went to the, the farmers in the vicinity around him and he leased all their fields. That's why his bank manager got nervous. Because he bet everything on his faith. And so we like to think and we limit God by thinking that's what faith, a work of faith is, some great act of demonstrating we're in faith. But no, the just shall live by faith. The righteous, those who are made righteous, live by faith. It's your daily getting up and you're going to work or to school or whatever it is that you're doing, whatever tragedy you're dealing with now, whatever low slump you're in, whatever mountain and success and peak you're dealing with, you have to live there by faith. The good and the bad, the highs and the lows. Amen. But I want to focus today on Abraham. Abraham, because he's called the father of faith. And there's some great examples uh, that you get when you look at his life. Some wonderful life lessons. Now, in any journey, there are things that make the journey better. They improve the journey. When I was growing up, they didn't have no services. And I don't know about you, but my generation of fathers did not stop to pee. It was a seven-hour journey. You sat in the car for seven hours. Daddy didn't stop for nothing. And where he did stop to petrol in, there was no toilets. If you had some time, you stuck behind the bush there quickly. But we grew up in Africa. So services make the journey better. There's things that improve the journey. They make the experience of getting somewhere better. They make it happen faster. Where we used to go on holiday growing up, before they built a motorway, it used to take us nine hours. To build a motorway, it takes five and a half hours. It's like, thank God for the motorway. And then they put services on. Yes. Then my dad wouldn't stop there because they were too expensive. <laughs> Equally, there are things that do the opposite on a journey. They slow you down like a bladder of a three-year-old. They divert you. Wife who wants to stop at every shop she goes past. Bucky's. Bucky's is the world's largest services in Texas. It's ridiculous. If you think big, think 10 times bigger, and then you know what Bucky's is like. They divert you, they get you lost, or they stop you all together on the journey. Yeah. Amen? So, I was trying to find a practical example of this, but because we have a big spread of ages, we have a variety of games that have been played over the years. If we go back to my generation, we played games like Snakes and Ladders. Do you remember Snakes and Ladders? Yeah. Not everyone's played Snakes and Ladders. Um, but you get the newer generations, and you've got computer games. Uh, and, then, and then now you've got console games. And so if we use snakes and ladders as an example, uh, and on the other side of the spectrum, we use Mario Kart. Easy, babe. But there's some similarities in these games. In snakes and ladders, you start here, you're supposed to end there. And if you hit a snake, you get swallowed by it and you go backwards. And if you find a ladder, you climb up it and go forwards. So the ladders improve your journey. The snakes hinder your journey. Uh, Mario Kart, you start on this little race, you pick your character, and you got this race, and while you're racing, you get boosters. They make you go faster. Or uh, they, they make you bounce off walls or something. I don't know. But then you also get things that slow you down. The squid squisher thing. <laughs> the electric bolt from the back that blows everyone up. The things that slow you down so that it, the race becomes a little bit more difficult. So there are some very powerful spiritual lessons in that because there are some accelerators of your faith on your journey. There's some accelerators of your faith. There's some things that will make your faith work better. They'll improve the process. But there are also some roadblocks. There's some squids and snakes. But there's also some ladders and boosts and all the rest. Do you understand? So let's talk quickly about 
uh, the good ones first. Let's talk about the accelerators of your faith. So these are things that improve your journey. They make the experience of getting somewhere better. They make it happen faster. Amen? And I've got a few. Let me give them to you. Number one, obedience. Ooh. Obedience. The first accelerator of your faith is obedience. Amen? <laughs> Genesis 12 uh, and verse 1. I think we're on the scriptures now, Abraham. Genesis 12 and verse 1. God says to Abraham, go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I shall show you. Go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I shall show you. So if you want to get where God wants you to be, you need, need to be willing to listen to him because there's a going involved. And not, there's not just a going, there's a manner of going. We, we've, we've heard this, that it's not, it's not how you start that finishes it. How you, it's not how you start the counts, it's how you finish the counts. And I understand, yeah, as long as, yeah. The problem is how you start counts if you're running 100 meters. How you run counts if you're running 100 meters. Or if you're swimming a freestyle. Or, do you understand? There's rules to starting and competing and running and finishing. And it's the same thing that's, that is true within the word of God. He says, go from your country, from your relatives, and from your father's house. It should be self-explanatory that you cannot be a follower of God. You cannot be being led by God if you aren't listening to God. It's like, I'm going to, it's like trying to have cats as a pet. I have a neighbor that has a cat as a pet. He takes the cat for a walk. Well, in reality, the cat walks in because it doesn't listen to him. It just walks and he wanders after it, calling it. Now, I'm not having a go at cat owners because I've had a Staffordshire Bull Terrier that used to take me for a walk on my belly across the park. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the, the, the simple reality is that, that you are the lead. It follows you. God is the lead. He says to Peter, Peter, follow me. And at the end of his life, he says, it doesn't matter what I do with other people, Peter. You follow me. So we have to be obedient. If you aren't going to be willing to be obedient to what the word says to you, then you are going to slow yourself down. What could be an accelerator becomes a decelerator. A decelerator, yeah. Unfortunately, too many of us think this is our life, that it's all about us. Galatians 2 and verse 20 says, I have been crucified. What happens to crucified people? They die. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. But Christ who lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I've told the story before. We had a, when we were at Bible school, I had a thorn in the flesh. Just pray for me. Um, but every day, this man just wound me up. I just had to look at him. <laughs> Ask my wife, the first day I got to Bible school, the very first day he irritated me. I said, look at that guy sucking up to the monitors. He wants to be a monitor. That was my first view of this guy. And eventually, after two years of Bible school, I was complaining to the Lord. And I said, look, I know you said to Paul that my grace is sufficient for you, but this thought, Lord. And the Lord spoke to me and he said to me, the problem you have with a thorn is because you have too much flesh. And I was like, what? And he said to me, if you take a dead man and stab him in the eyeball with a thorn, he doesn't blink. The fact that you reacted, that all these things are irritating you. The fact that you, you think it's all about you. Amen. Obedience is the key to getting where God's trying to get you fast. It'll, it's an accelerator. Learn to listen to God. The second accelerator is worship. It's worship. And when we talk about worship in Abraham's life, you see that Abraham built altars. When he got to the promised land, he built altars. And there's one example in Genesis 12, verses 5 through 8. Abraham took his wife, Sarai, and his nephew, Lot. Uh, that was Abraham's first mistake. Took Lot. Did God not say to him, he said to him, go from your country and from your relatives. Mm. So he took a relative with. 
and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the people which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the Oak of Morah. And from, Canaan, from the Canaanites, now the Canaanites were in the land at that time. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and he said to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord. Amen. And, and he builds at least four altars that we can find in scripture as he traveled around Canaan. Your faith, your priority on a faith journey is to remain a worshiper. Your priority on a faith journey is to remain a worshiper. Why? Because it keeps you focused on the Lord. It keeps your priorities set right. You don't get distracted because the devil is not a fool. If you start on a spiritual journey, suddenly you'll get business opportunities to take you that way. Yeah. You'll, get, you'll get the love of your life will want to go this way. Right. I recommitted my life to the Lord and the hottest woman I'd ever seen threw herself at me. No, it was long before you. <laughs> she was of the devil, not of you. Michelle, that was then, okay? That was at that point in time, she was the hottest woman I'd ever seen. Then I got to know you and that all changed. She's... But do you, re- you understand how the devil, listen, the devil does not change. De- when, when, we, when we came into ministry, I was in IT. And we were living, working in London. I was earning a fortune. And the Lord said, come, give up. It's time to come. And at the time, the Lord said to me, there's going to be a temptation to get sucked back into it. And I went to my wife and I went to Pastor Jerry and I said, this is going to happen. I want to hold myself accountable. And a few months later, my agent phoned me up and said, I got a contract for you. It was good money, better than I'd earned before. And I was on good money. Problem was it was in Bournemouth. And I went to I went to my wife and I said, here's the temptation. I went to Pastor Jerry and I said, here's the temptation. And I said no to the contract. Because this was the journey God would have me on. Do you understand? You've got to be absolutely committed. And the way you do that is you worship. It's a wor- an act of worship. I, I live my life as an act of worship. Well, that's what we do as believers. I'm not special. But unless you're willing to build some altars, what what purpose do altars serve? They become a place for prayer. They become a place for worship. They become a place for consecration. They become a place to remember. And so if God puts you somewhere on a journey and you built an altar there, that's where you stay. Because there's an altar. That's where you come and pray. That's where you come and worship. There's an altar. The building of, of an altar is important, guys. It, it implies commitment. To build an altar is, is demonstrates a commitment to where you're placing that altar. Yeah. That's why Moses, uh, Abraham builds altars in Canaan. Not somewhere in the Negreb on the way to Canaan. Yeah. In Canaan. Yeah. It talks of dedication to the things God is leading you to. It talks of attachment to the things God has called you to. It, it, it has spiritual significance for you personally. It has spiritual significance. You pour your life into that altar. And it's interesting because those altars are, are they significant. They imply a commitment to a place very often. As I said, Abraham built them in the promised land. He didn't build them, build them on the way. And that way was fertile. He prospered on that way but he built the place of worship where God wanted him to be. The third accelerator. So the first is obedience, accelerator of faith. The second one is building altars, being a worshiper. Second accelerator. The third accelerator is the digging of wells. The digging of wells. Abraham dug wells in Canaan, not on the way. You dig wells where you plan to prosper. You dig wells where you plan to prosper. You don't dig wells where you're journeying through. You don't buy a house. If you, if you want to go and live in, on the Lizard Peninsula and you've got your dream home there, you don't buy a house in Bridging on the way. Do you understand? That's not where you called. It's not where you're being sent. It's not where your faith is bringing you. It's not where your father's house is for you particularly. In Genesis chapter 26, verses 15 and 18, 
Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they'd filled them with earth. And then in verse 18, and Isaac, and Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. You see, wells are where life flows. It's where water comes from. They imply permanence of life. If you know any of the desert countries, the, the, the oasis where the, where the well is is critical. Absolutely important. They become the source of blessing. If you happen to own the build, or the building, if you happen to own the land where the well is, you prosper because everyone needs to pay to use your water. For desert people, they, they meant everything. Absolutely everything. These wells. And the wells were for everybody. You didn't, the worst thing you could do was pollute a well. Because now you can't drink it, but the next person can't, and the next person can't. And so it was like communal in that sense. Guys, wells are important. You dig wells, and the provision, and the blessing, and the outpouring of what God's trying to get to you comes where the well is. If you leave the well, the blessing is there. Now, people are going, oh, so I'm not going to be blessed if I'm not at the place. I don't know what God's going to do and God's not going to do. He can do all things. I'm telling you that where you dig a well, that well produces water and that place is blessed. Now, if you want to go elsewhere, go elsewhere, but you're going to need to find another well. This is not the only place that is blessed. This place has wells that God placed here to provision this church and this community of believers with what they needed to do the work of the kingdom. If this is where God's calling you, if this is your place, then dig a well. Dig a well. Just all get ready to say amen and you'll know I'm not talking about you now. The fourth accelerator. The fourth accelerator is tithing. Abraham was a tither. He starts to tithe. The only place we find record of it is at this particular point. Genesis 14, verse 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and he said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Abraham was already prosperous. But he understood how important this was with regards to him getting where he wanted to go. Amen. Remember that you are doing God's things. If you're on a journey of faith, you are following God. He is leading you. It's about his business. We are supposed to pray, may your kingdom come on earth, not may my kingdom come in your earth, Lord. It's God's business we're about, okay? And so he, we have to be about his things. And he pays for it. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 8. One of my favorite scriptures entirely. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, God is able to make all grace, that's all God's power and ability, abound towards you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. God pays. He makes things abound to you when you're about His work. Amen. He pays for what He commissions and calls you to do. But He chooses to do it through a biblical process of getting finances to you. And it's clearly defined there. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. Amen. That's the principle. And so Abraham accelerates his journey by tithing. He, in the land, he finds a, a priest of God and he tithes. Because he know, knows, look, look what Abraham says about it, or what the priest says about it. He said, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. God possesses heaven and earth. 
and he's going to bless you, Abraham. Being someone who operates in biblical financial principles, so critical. <laughs> Do you know what? Do you know what's the last part of you that joins the church? Your wallet. It usually joins two or three years after you actually join. It's the funniest thing. We have this deep, deep, deep affection to our money. So let's talk in the last 20 minutes, 15 minutes of roadblocks, those decelerators, roadblocks to your faith. So we've looked at, we've looked at four things that will, uh, that will speed up your faith. We've looked at some of the ladders, the things that will get you there quicker. Now, you don't have to believe them. Don't be obedient. Don't worship. Don't tithe. Spend time on the road. Go around the mountain. Amen. Roadblocks to faith. These are the things that do the opposite to accelerate you. They slow you down. They divert you. They get you lost or they stop you altogether. They can do as much as actually stop you and cause you to give up on the journey. And there's only three here, and I will say to you, they're not fun. Number one, relationships. Relationships. Now, Abraham takes his family, but he was not supposed to take anyone else. He was not supposed to take his relatives. Amen? I read it earlier on, Genesis 12, verses 1 and then verse 4. Go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And verse 4, so Abraham went as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Mm -hmm. So what am I saying? Your, your relationships can massively impact your effectiveness in the kingdom. Who you choose to connect yourself with and align yourself with and allow to, allow to align themselves with you. Amen. Let me look at some scripture very quickly. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. For what, you, for what do righteousness and lawlessness share together? Or what does light have in common with darkness? Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. Man, do, do, not be, do not marry an unbeliever thinking they might change. The word works the other way. You will change. Do not go into business with an unbeliever. He's going to rip you off. Don't be unequally yoked. Do not be mismatched. Your family. Let's talk about that. This is a tough one. And I have a caveat with regards to this. But anyway, let me get there. Matthew 10, verse 37 through 39. Matthew 10, 37 through 39. The one who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who loves sons or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And the one who has found his life will lose it. And the one who has lost his life on my account will find it. And then Mark 10, verse 28 through 30. Mark 10, 28 through 30. Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything, and I followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Now, let me be very clear. Abraham went with his entire family. He took his wife. He took his household. He had to leave his father's household. But Lot was not in his household. And he took Lot. God is not telling you to abandon your spouse, your children. He's not telling you to abandon your mother and your father. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about if you're willing to abandon God for any of those people, there is a problem. I acknowledge that following the call of God to the UK with my wife and my children was incredibly difficult for my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, for my father and my mother. It was incredibly difficult for my children to grow up with cousins that they never saw. Now that I'm on the verge of being a granddad, no, she's not pregnant yet, but we are just. But now that I'm facing that in my life, the thought that she lives in Birmingham is horrifying. I'm praying, Lord, move them closer. Do you understand? So I, and I went to my mother and my mother-in-law, and I said, I'm so sorry. But I would have done it anyway. 
I'm now more empathetic. I understand what it cost. But I had to listen to God. The call of God must come first. And you don't depart from those relationships. You don't destroy the relationships. You work hard to keep those relationships in place. But the word of God must come first. We've done over the years, we've done a number of things that the word requires us to do. Then we go to our family and we say to our in-laws and my mother and brothers, this is what God's word says I've got to do. This is why I'm doing it. And they don't get it. You're mad. You're nuts. It's going to cost you. It doesn't matter. God's word. I cannot claim to be a believer and not live according to his word. Amen. I understand your relationships. And, and, and for, for the simple reality, for us, it's not our spouses and our children. It's our friends that are the problem. It's our friends that are the problem. They are the ones that draw you aside. Number two, the, the, and this is probably one of the biggest problems or decelerators, roadblocks to faith, is not recognizing your place. Not recognizing your place. Abraham never dwelt in Canaan. He was a sojourner, if you read the old King James. A visitor. Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he, called, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he left, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a stranger. That word stranger is the word sojourner. It means not having a home there in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which we had foundations, whose architect and builder was God. So Abraham never dwelt in Canaan. He moved whenever the circumstances got tough. When his wife catches the eye of the, of the Pharaoh, oh, sorry, the king, he was like, nah, let's leave. Let's misrepresent. When the drought comes, when the famine comes, he goes to Egypt. He was always easily packing up and leaving. So let's talk about that for a minute. Because that's, that, that's, <laughs> that's for lack of a better thing, it, let's call it a vagabond. Let's talk, about, let's talk about people that have a vagabond spirit. A vagabond is a person who is unsettled and irresponsible, a wanderer without any fixed destination or home. They move often. They take flight at a moment's notice. So we, we kind of, when we think of a vagabond spirit, we kind of think of Cain, and, and that's all we're talking about here. We're talking about people that don't settle. They come but don't settle. They're easily offended. A vagabond is a person who moves from place to place, having no place to call home. You know, they say home is where the heart is. That's not true for a vagabond. Home is not where the heart is. The heart's on the open road, buddy. Route 66. Freedom. Do you understand? The vagabond doesn't want to belong. He wants to leave. He wants to go. He, he, the, any excuse, you're getting too clingy. You're getting too demanding. It's hot. It's humid. It's cold. Whatever. Any excuse. And him and his sleeping bag are out of here. Spiritually speaking. A vagabond is a person who moves from place to place. There is no place of spiritual rest for such a person. They don't build altars and they don't dig wells. They come and worship at your altar and drink from your well. God created us and designed us a spirit to, sorry, God created us and designed us to be spiritually planted. Amen. Believers who are wondrous keep themselves from truly bearing lasting fruit. If you will not be planted, you can't bear fruit. Isn't that right? A tree must be in this ground. A plant must be in the ground for a season. It must grow in the ground. It must bear fruit in the ground. The, the, the farmer must harvest its fruit where it is in the ground. They do not allow themselves to be used to build anything in the kingdom with any lasting permanence. You see, people with roots always bear fruit. If you want to be fruitful, there needs to be roots. No roots, no fruit. No fruit is because there's no roots. Psalm 1 verses 3. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and in whatever he does, he prospers. Amen. You have to be planted somewhere. You cannot be a vagabond. 
You see, when you are planted, you will never cease from bearing fruit. Did you know that's what the word says? If you allow the Holy Spirit to plant you somewhere, you will never cease from being fruitful. Jeremiah verses 17. Sorry, chapter 17, verses 7 through 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and does not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. Irrespective of the circumstances, if God's planted you, you will bear fruit. So why is God so adamant about you being planted? Well, believers that are not planted are people without a home. You need to be in a home to be planted. They leave easily. If corrected or rebuked, if confronted, they leave. They get intimidated in our churches. Sorry, they get intimate in our churches for a season, but they never stay. They move on. They wander from church home to church home, looking for something, never happy with anything that they find. And if they do have a place they call home, they don't attend with any measure of frequency. They are wanderers within a fellowship. God cannot depend on them to build his church. Jesus cursed the fig tree because it did not have fruit. You will not have fruit without roots. You have to be planted where God wants you to be planted. And listen, don't feel like I'm intimidating you into this church. I'm just trying to intimidate you into some church. <laughs> you, as a believer, you, you need to find a place where you agree, where you get the vision, where you want to sow your life, where you want to pour your vessel out. Number three, fear will road be a roadblock to faith. Fear every time. Amen. Abraham had it loads in his life. He feared that his wife would be stolen. Now let's just be practical here for a moment. She's 100. She, I'm sure she was exquisitely beautiful. She was, ex- I'm sure she was, she must have been because the Pharaoh took her. <laughs> but fear. I used to say this as a teenager and people used to confuse me endlessly. They could never could understand me. I do not have a jealous pony in my body. Because if she wants to cheat on me, she can. I can't stop her. I could lock her up in the bedroom 24 hours a day and throw through through the window. She can still cheat in her heart. I have to trust her commitment to me. Amen. And that's how I choose to live my life. I'm not going to worry about what other people do. It's beyond my control. I can't control what she's doing. I'm not responsible for what she's doing. She is. So I'm just going to live with my trust in her, my trust in God. And if, and, if, and if bad things have happened, I get things have gone wrong, people have been cheated on, but that's not your fault. Because someone does something despicable, that's not your fault. Do you, you understand? Don't allow them to make it your responsibility. Genesis 12, verses 10 through 13. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a time. There's a famine in the land. So he goes, no problem. Pack the tents up, round up the donkeys, get the camels. We're going to Egypt. Notice God didn't send him. When Isaac wants to go, God says, don't go. Makes you wonder who prayed more. Maybe. It came about when he was approaching Egypt that he said to his wife, Sarah, Sarah, I see now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister so that it may go well for me because of you and that I may live on account of you. And there's the problem. Me, you, I, I want to be well. You, you prostitute yourself. My wife who I love deeply so that I can be okay, Jack. Amen. It was a fear and it was a fear of doing so because he would lose his inheritance. Why was it important? Because the inheritance was coming through this woman. And if the the Pharaoh stole this woman, then he didn't have an inheritance. He's worried about himself. He's worried about his inheritance. And God eventually has Isaac lying on on an altar. You have to be willing to lay all of that down. In Genesis 15, verses 1 and 2, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not fear Abraham. So all of these things happen in Abraham's life. And eventually God gets hold of him and says, don't fear 
I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be great. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? So there's his heart displayed. God says to him, don't fear. And he says, but what will you give me? Because I don't have a child. That's my fear. I have no inheritance. It ends with me. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So the scripture says that fear is a spirit, yeah? 2 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. Let's finish with this. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear. Cowardice is what that word actually means. But of power and love and discipline or sound judgment. Discipline there means sound judgment. Old translations call it a sound mind. Fear is earmarked by a lack of love. Don't tell me you love me and you're walking around in fear that I might do something to you or that I may have done something to you or that I may have stolen something from you. It's a good indication as to whether you're in fear or love. You know, at the end of the day, if God owns everything, and you come and steal my car, God, give me another car. Because God owns everything. But if I walk around in fear and your car gets stolen, well, then you've got a problem. You cannot be, and notice these three things are diametrically opposed. In other words, you cannot be in love and in fear. And therefore, conversely, if you are not walking in love, fear is your friend. And fear is a spirit from hell. So walk in love. The consequence is significant. Not giving me a spirit of fear. Amen. But of power and love. And so power to do the will of God. That's what that power, God says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will give you power. If there's no power in your life, if your Christianity is powerless, bland, because you're worried, you're walking in fear, you're concerned about things instead of walking in faith. And lastly, it says discipline, sound judgment, sound thinking. You cannot be in fear and think clearly. You will make irrational decisions. Amen. People with phobias. I, I can speak with great boldness here because I don't have any phobias. Uh, no, mind you, I don't like a moth <laughs> or a bat. Um, but, but people with phobias have an absolutely irrational fear of something. I, I, I know people that won't step on cracks on pavements. I know people that when they see a bird, they stop until the bird's gone. Spiders that are this big just step on it. Problem gone. They won't step on the spider. I took, I worked with a girl. I took a rescue her from a house in the middle of the day because no one had seen her. And in South Africa, she lived by herself and it was concerning. So my boss said, you need to go find her. And, I, and her car's in the driveway and the lights are on. And I'm like, what's going on? So I'm walking around her garden expecting to find her shot dead in her, in her bedroom or something. And, I, and there she is. In, I can see through her window. She's in the bedroom, in the corner, wrapped up in her pajamas, in an absolute state, screaming and crying. I'm knocking on the window, and she sees me. I said, what's the matter? She says, there's a spider in the passage. I said, what? She says, there's a spider in the passage. I can't get out of bed. I had to break into her house and go and remove the dead spider. And I wasn't allowed to put it in the dustbin in the garden. I had to take it somewhere else. I flung it in the bush. But she was so worried about the dead spider that I had to take it somewhere else. That's an irrational fear. You can't be. Now listen, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. God is not, there's nothing to fear on this journey. If you're going to walk in fear, you are going to get slowed down, stopped, halted, distracted. Amen. So as we close today, decide, first of all, to go to the house. Let me go to my father's house. Make, decide to commit to the journey. Acknowledge that being a believer is on a journey somewhere. You have to follow the Lord. And then think about those things in your life that are going to slow you down or speed you up. Because here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is given as a guide. He'll lead you past the snake. Snakes and ladders. He'll lead you past the squid monster in Mario Kart. Do you understand? He'll bring you to the accelerators. He'll take you to the shortcuts. Because in John 16, he says, I'm going to lead you to me. Lead you to truth. You have a choice to make today, folks. Stay where you are, camping at one of the services of life. 
convincing yourself that paying three pounds seventy for a cup of coffee is worth it. Maybe we could build a little house over there. Showers are not too bad. Or get on, on get on with the journey. Realize this is where you find yourself now is not the end of where you need to be. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning, for your word that has spoken to us so powerfully, Lord God. We thank you that you all have us on a journey. You're all moving us. You're moving all of us, Lord God, to a place of wholeness in you. We thank you for your spirit of leads and guides. Help us to recognize the pitfalls, Lord, that we may not fall victim to them, Lord. Help us to, to recognize those accelerators, Lord, that we may find ourselves in all that you have for us that much the faster, Father. Lord, I pray for every person that's heard the word this morning, and I pray that you challenge their hearts, Father, that every one of us will be challenged to get better at knowing you, growing with you, and following you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. If you're sitting here today and you do not know the Lord as your Savior, if you can just have every eye closed for a moment, just bow your heads if you wouldn't mind, just to give people some privacy. If you do not know the Lord as your Savior, don't go from this place without giving him that opportunity. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that he is Christ, he is who he says he is. And you're willing to say that with your mouth. He'll move you from darkness to light. It's as simple as that. And why do you need to be in light? Because after this life there is death and then there is judgment. And the judgment will determine an eternity with God or eternity without Him. And trust me, you do not want to be without Him. Maybe you've known the Lord, you've prayed and you're far from Him now, you've journeyed from Him for whatever reason, you've backslid and you know what that means. Also, don't go from this place without making right to God. Just while every eye is closed and every head is bowed, if you want me to pray with you, I'd love to do so. Quickly just slip your hand up so I can see who you are. I can identify you and I can pray with you. That would be great. I know sometimes there's a wrestling that goes on in your heart. So I'll just give you some space. Praise God. Thank you very much, folks.